This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Bit of a bummer last night watching Monday Night Football with Nick Chubb going down with a pretty gross looking injury and it's a tough one it's uh it's not fun when football has these impactful injuries and unfortunately that means we have to f- turn our focus towards the futures market and dig into the asd north right now because the baltimore ravens in a pretty good position we're gonna dive in talk about the asd north uh where the ravens the bengals the browns and steelers all stand there take a look at stock up stock down after week number two and then turn our eyes towards week three and the futures market. That's right now here on Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here once again by Ryan Williams. Check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Ryan, like I said, kind of a, a, a down night last night with the Nick Chubb injury. But uh, how did Monday night go for you beyond the Chubb injury? Yeah, I mean that w- that was a tough one. Uh, had had uh, we talked about Nick Chubb on the show and had had some bets that were kind of tied to him, uh, but you know uh, we liked you know the Pickens yeah. uh, bet. Jonathan Mingo uh, actually got there like in the fourth quarter late. Uh, shout yeah. out garbage time. Uh, so your bets <laughs> are never dead when uh, when garbage time can be around. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a pretty pretty decent night, but definitely overshadowed by. Uh, the the Chubb injury and you just kind of you know really really felt bad for for him um, and you know we hope we hope and wish him a speedy recovery uh, but we can you know we'll talk about this Browns outlook going forward uh, because I do feel like it is bleak. It is bleak and I know we talk about running backs and their impact you know and how people. It'll be minimalized at times, but like Nick Chubb actually makes a difference to the passing offense too because of his presence as like a good running back you have to account for. So I actually do agree that it's a pretty big downgrade for this offense too. And don't sell yourself short, Ryan. It wasn't just the Mingo bet. It was also Rashid Shaheed, uh, 63 yards for him. Didn't get the touchdown, but like got the 63 yards there. He had Steelers plus two and a half. Uh, I mentioned George Pickens. Chuba Hubbard, you talked about him. He didn't get rushing, but he had 34 receiving yards. So if you took the rushing plus receiving, pretty good night for you, uh, yeah. you know, uh, okay. overall. So I, I I think that that does help a little bit to have a pretty good read on last night's games. Yeah, we'll just we'll just keep, you know, once again, taking Steelers uh, to two and a half. It, it was nice to see that kind of come to fruition. And, you know, uh, when the defense outscores the offense right. uh, in, in points, uh, it's just how the how the cookie crumbles. But, yeah, definitely like that they were able to uh, to hit that cover there. It looked a little bit dicey uh, yeah. at a point, but we'll we'll take it. Steelers now 20 wins in a row at home on Monday Night Football. Wow. Absolutely incredible. Um, so, you know, it's just, uh, sometimes the trends work in our favor, Jim. That's insane. I'm going to ask you to not listen to the second half of the show because I might be betting against our Steelers in week number three. So, uh, I'll ask you to just not listen (laughs) to that part later on. We're going to talk about, uh, the futures market and get you ready by talking about some power rankings. And then I'll talk about where my model shows value in week number three later on in the show. But first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast. We also are available on the FanDuel YouTube page and on FanDuel TV plus if you want to watch us alongside up and Adams. You can watch that live by logging into your FanDuel account. You can check out the solo shot with Tom Vecchio there, or NFL DFS podcast. The heat check is up there as well. Go to FanDuel.com slash watch or download FanDuel TV Plus on your Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Roku devices as well. Ryan, let's dig into the futures market now and talk about this AFC North because it's not just the Nick Chubb injury for the Cleveland Browns. It's also Joe Burrow dealing with this calf injury and at risk of missing some games, potentially missing week number three against the Los Angeles Rams, who are a much tougher opponent now than they appear to be earlier on this year. Market seems like it's kind of hedging, putting it halfway between Joe Burrow and Jake Browning right now. So it's a rough spot. Meanwhile, the Baltimore Ravens are 2-0, and Lamar Jackson has played awesome, at least this most recent week especially. So the Ravens are minus 110 to win the AFC North right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Do you think there is value in that number or does that number properly account for 
the decimation we've seen across the rest of this division. Yeah, it uh, it properly accounts for it, Jim. I mean, we just have to know, and, and we don't know, right? We don't know an injury with Joe Burrow. But Joe Burrow's, you know, talking to the media about how, you know, we've had rough starts before. People have counted us out. And, you know, the talent is there on this roster. It is through two weeks. And so if we can, you know, if, luckily for the – for the Bengals, they have an early buy um, or earlier buy, I should say, as it comes with week seven. So, you know, you're looking at the Rams. Uh, I think they get to, you know, they play on the road against Tennessee and the Cardinals. Um, I'm forgetting the other team that they have right before the buy now, but then they come out of the buy and they got to play Buffalo and San Fran. Uh, so you really hope that they can kind of just win a couple of these matchups, albeit that they'll have two road games here going into the bye against some tough opponents. Uh, Joe Mixon's going to have to step up for this team uh, because they're going to need somebody to just kind of catalyst this offense. Jake Browning's only had one pass attempt uh, in his career uh, with this team. So it, it could be tough sledding for them, but I, you know, we are still in week two, Jim. And this is the, this is the thing that we kind of talked about last week where we don't want to feel like there's still 15 games left in the season. So we don't want to think that we know everything after two weeks. And if you're telling me right now that the Baltimore Ravens sit at minus, you know, 110 at just two wins, like if Joe Burrow ends up coming back and is healthy and what happens after the bye, you know, and he, you know, they're able to rate the ship right now. I think you just are looking at, we, we need to be in the wild card hunt, you know, I, and I, of course the division is, is where you, you know, I'm sure, where Zach Taylor is talking about them, but if they can just kind of stay in the wild card hunt with the extra team that gets there, like outside of the AFC East, I like, I really don't know if any other division is going to be sending like two teams, Jim, like this is the kind of the people we're talking about. Like the chargers are in just as much of disarray. The yeah. AFC South is, you know, the AFC South, it's a joke. <laughs> um, and then you got Buffalo and Miami and, and those are just the two teams that are making it from that division. Like, I, I just have no faith in the Patriots or, or Jets, obviously, with uh, their uh, woes across the board. So I still think the Bengals are in prime position. We talked about their futures market here. I'd still be willing to take them uh, on the division. I think, you know, Super Bowl might be a little bit dicey sure. for me. And even maybe the conference one, but I think if you can get them at plus four forty here, uh, and if we you know get their playoff you know prop to make the playoffs, if that comes back up, uh, we definitely want to look at that and uh, take advantage of what we you know it, it's uncertainty, and that's what's nice about you know getting money in and bet, bets is that you know the we think the Bengals are dead after two losses, and right. that has not been the case before. Yeah, I was trying to find that exact market you were discussing. The to make a to make the playoffs market. It's not up right now, as you alluded to. I think that'd be interesting as well, because then the O and two doesn't matter as much there, because like you said, the depth in the AFC has taken a pretty big hit with the Aaron Rodgers injury. Um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened that's kind of impacted that. And also, I think the Nick Chubb injury does impact that, too, because I thought the Browns, I still think the Browns could be a playoff team, uh, but that does hurt their outlook uh, with Chubb being banged up. And I think that the depth of the AFC being diminished a bit does impact things for sure. Uh, going back to that schedule you discussed for Cincinnati, uh, their schedule before the bye is the Rams this week on the road against Titans on the road against Arizona and then at home against Seattle. And like, those are pretty winnable yeah. games. So I'm not sure what burrow status is. Maybe he it does wind up sitting on Monday night in which case that game would probably be around a pick or the Rams by, you know, like a point and a half or somewhere around there. If that does wind up happening, they could lose that game and be Oh, Oh, and three, but, and maybe you want to take a break on that in the Bengals futures until after that game. Uh, but I think it's accounted for in the market, as you said. So I agree. The Ravens minus 110, not the best time to buy into them. Let's look back at week number two beyond just the AFC North, Ryan. Talk about which teams impacted or which teams you thought impressed you the most as far as when you're trying to power rank teams heading into week three. Who got the biggest boost for you based on what you've seen either in week two specifically or through the first two weeks this year? Yeah, you know, I uh, who are we talking about? You know, I was talking about the Rams, uh, future, yeah. um, uh, you know, winning that conference and I, I or winning that division, excuse me. And I don't know that that's necessarily going to come to fruition, but it definitely has been extremely impressive. Um, you know, 
even even from the defensive side of the ball, you know, just to be able to contain as, you know, having a hard time think about pieces outside of Aaron Donald on that defense. But, you know, Matthew Stafford is, you know, elevating receivers yet again in his career uh, with Puka Nakua just showing out um, for that team. So they've, they've kind of been surprising. But the team that also, you know, I want to talk about is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I get mm-hmm. it. You know, they kind of, you know, have played the Vikings who are 0-2. They played two NFC North teams. They played the Vikings and they played the Bears. And those are four losses between those two teams. But, uh, you know, I think that they kind of control their own destiny right now as it relates to uh, the division over eight and a half wins. You know, if you think that, you know, nine wins out of nine wins out of 17 is going to win that division, you're getting plus money on the over eight and a half. Like that's kind of interesting. That division um, is definitely winnable. I'm looking at them and they're plus 420. And I just, I'm not really convinced that the Saints and the Falcons are worth, you know, almost three times or three times less the odds of Tampa Bay winning that division. So they've, they've really impressed me. Um, I think that the team who is really, you know, yet again, just disappointing. And, you know, I think it's interesting when we talk about like coaching markets um, and who's going to be, you know, on the hot seat first, which Eberflus is, is definitely taking a run at that. Uh, but Brandon Staley uh, has his work cut out for him to kind of right the ship here for the Chargers. Like there's absolutely, you know, no excuse for this team yet again to, you know, not be competing, let alone if they are missing the playoffs again, um, you know, in Herbert's in Herbert's early, early career and in his prime. Um, that's that's really, really concerning for me. Um, and then Dallas is one that I'm going to be keeping an eye on as well, too. They are now plus 105, I believe, matched with Philly um, to win that uh, division there. And, I, you know, I think we we know what the defense is. Uh, the defense has been this way for, for a couple of years now. I need to see what happens when the offense. Pushed. I need to see, you know, what Dak and Pollard and and CD and these guys can do because, you know, outside of those outside of those two pieces, Jim, like it, it's kind of, you know, Brandon Cooks has been on the injury report. Um, you know, Dalton Schultz not being there uh, has definitely affected some stuff. As Ferguson and Hendershoot are are just not those guys. So see if the offense can kind of keep up with this defense along the way because um, right now I still like Philly to win that division. Yeah, they're both plus 105 right now, as you mentioned. I want to go back here to uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because you talked about them. And honestly, Ryan, I think they might be the the team that has deviated most from my expectations so far this year. Like maybe it's the Bengals in a negative sense, but like in a positive sense, I kind of lean towards the Bucs. Uh, they're playing Tampa or they're playing Philly this week. I actually like the Bucks plus five and a half. What could go wrong there? But uh, <laughs> Baker's look good. And I think the thing that that to me, Ryan, is reassuring about that is we've seen Baker play well in stretches before. So it's not like yeah. Mayfield being competent is totally out of nowhere. This might be the best group of pass catchers he's had. Not to like, you know, I don't know, maybe. I mean, he had Odell Beckham and stuff like that. But like Mike Evans, Chris Godwin's a pretty good combo. So... I'm not sure, you know, my read on them with the NFC South, because I do still like the Saints quite a bit. I'm lower than most on the Falcons, I think. Um, but like, I'm I'm kind of OK with the Bucks. Do you think they got a shot at plus 420 to win this division? I, I, I do. I do think they have a shot. You know, this defense has been one that is going to, you know, need to need to step it up but when you look at okay so like we're talking about the two wins they're outside the division Jim so like if they can compete against the Saints like the Falcons Panthers twice like now we're talking about you know you're kind of cooking with gas and playing with home money almost you know with the opponents in your division kind of just be able to control with two out of division wins so um I, I I do I do like that number especially you know when we're getting anything close to five to one you know after after two weeks that kind of still seems feasible um I think that, that that's a point where I want to take advantage of yeah I think that we can talk a lot about overreactions the first couple of weeks I feel like this one might be a bit of an underreaction now I'm showing value in Tampa Bay even though I've still got them 22nd in my power rankings uh based on a, a heavily influenced by a prior. So like I've got them 22nd. Uh, I'm still not very high on them, but I'm above market on them based on at least what we see here for week number three with the Eagles. So I feel like maybe we focus a lot on overreactions. I think this spot for them may be a bit 
of an underreaction. Let's talk here about the Chargers as well, because you alluded to them. They're just a weird team, man. Um, I, you know, uh, their win total is now eight and a half over is even money under is minus minus one twenty two, And they're a frustrating team, Ryan. What I will say is that, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but I thought their offense was pretty impressive in week two. I know they lost that game. Uh, but I liked a lot more what I saw of them in week two than what I saw in week one, even though they put up a lot of points in week one against the dolphins. I, I think that, Seeing Herbert chuck it a bit, seeing Mike Williams and Keenan Allen look pretty spry out there, I thought that that actually did did give them a boost. So I liked the Chargers under entering this year, but with it being at eight and a half right now, plus money on the over, they would need to go nine and math, uh, nine and seven, nine and six. There we go, nailed it. Nine and six over their final fifteen games to get the over here, but. I don't know. I don't want to get sucked into the Chargers, uh, especially especially not given that I was like low on them entering this year. But yeah, it's at least tempting to like maybe buy low on them. But I don't know if this is the week to do it. No, you want yeah, and you want a favor, you know, and you know, shout out to the markets, right? This is why they do that. But right. uh, you'd want it a little <laughs> bit more favorable than just a, right. a, a a one a one over one. Um, from that standpoint, like I think we 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 need a little bit more because this defense, uh, the offense and and the defense looks like they're struggling. We need to know the extent of uh, Austin Eckler being out too. Like mm-hmm. you know how how long has this been, Jim? Where we've seen you know Josh Kelly be the backup and the guy that they try and get going, and then I I get it. They were playing against Tennessee. It's a tough run defense, yeah. but Kelly just does not look like he's gonna be the guy to take over um for for Austin Eckler when when that time comes so they need to figure out a backup running back situation yeah they've been trying for years taking you know day two day three picks on running back and I guess day three picks primarily but haven't figured that down figured that out as of yet any final futures you're looking at uh before we get to week number three Ryan yeah I think for me um you know we talked about it again overreaction in week one like uh, let me action on the bills Right now, you know, things kind of get a little bit out of hand. They are now 10 to 1 uh, to, to win the Super Bowl. I even think uh, their win total, as I checked, um, over 10 and a half wins at minus 102. Like, yeah, that still kind of feels kind of, you know, maybe maybe we don't take a shot on that uh, just yet, but it feels appropriate. Um, but yeah, any future that I can get with the with the Bills right now, I, I'm, I'm taking that. Um, you know, Josh Allen in the MVP race, it's not – as favorable as you would want it to be there. Um, but he is 10 to one, you know, kind of matching Jalen hurts. Um, I, I think we just need to take shots on, on, you know, a proven commodity um, to be able to compete there uh, in the AFC. Yeah. And the bills uh, looked really good not. again on Sunday. And it, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. The future that I would. Sorry, cut out there for a bit. Second. No, go ahead, you're good Jim, to sorry. Go. Nope. You're all good. You cut out for a second, but you're back in now. <laughs> okay perfect uh yeah jo- you know anytime we're getting money on on josh allen in, in a favorable uh spot i think we gotta look at that yeah for sure uh you mentioned uh the super bowl odds for the for the bills they are 10 to 1 right now to win the super bowl that is tied with the ravens for second in the afc which is weird how things have shifted because before it was all afc top loaded and now we've got three nfc teams above that second tier in the AFC. And of course the Chiefs still plus 600 to win the AFC as the favorites out of the AFC teams. That is Ryan Williams. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W Ryan is with us once again, every Monday and Tuesday right here on the show. Ryan pleasure to have you on once again, and we'll talk to you once again, Monday, have a fantastic rest of your week. You too, Jim. Thanks so much. See you next time. All righty. Again, find Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Looking forward to having him back on again next week and seeing if he can duplicate a success that he had on Monday Night Football from this week. We're going to dive into what my numbers say about week three here and the betting markets in just one second. But first, the NFL Sunday Million on the DFS side of things is now live over on FanDuel.com. Put your NFL knowledge to the test and create your best nine-player roster while staying under the salary cap. 
Then use FanDuel's live scoring system as you follow along and compete for your share of $2 million in total prizes with first place taking home half a mil all for just a $5 entry fee. Sunday is coming quickly, so head over to FanDuel.com and get your lineups in today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app for more details. Let's take a look at what my numbers are saying here about week number three in the NFL, diving into money lines, totals, and spread where I show value over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And the first one is one that I mentioned when talking to Ryan. That is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers taking on the Philadelphia Eagles. That game is on Monday night football, the first game of the doubleheader. I actually show value in the Bucs plus five and a half in this game against the Eagles, and I will take that personally. Tampa Bay has looked awesome on offense so far this year, and this is going to be the toughest task t- t- toughest task yet, because as Ryan mentioned, they faced just a couple of NFC North teams with pretty bad defense. And the Eagles are not that, but Eagles defense is not at full health. They have had a lot of time to get healthy because they played Thursday. They won't play again until Monday. So maybe the pieces they were playing without in the second half in week two will be back for week three. But again, Baker Mayfield looks good so far. And I don't think it's like totally outrageous to think that could be somewhat sustainable because Baker led a team to the playoffs before with, I would say, worse pass catchers than what he has right now. He's got Mike Evans looking like he's in his mid-20s again. Chris Godwin's played okay. I think this is a pretty good situation for the Buccaneers. Now, I don't think it's entirely out of the question the Bucs are a competent football team this year. Again, as mentioned, I've got them 23rd in my power rankings once you combine the prior with what we've seen so far this year. So I'm not like super, super high on them, but it's high enough to take the five and a half when the Buccaneers are at home. Looking at my model right now for this game, I've got the Eagles favored by 2.9 points. So, you know, for a team being on the road, that's a pretty decent number, but I think there's value in the Bucks here. So I'll take the block, the Bucks plus five and a half, minus 110 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Second bet for me for this week is on the Las Vegas Raiders. This is the Sunday night football game. Currently, they are slight dogs at home against the Steelers uh, with their money line at minus 104. So, you know, still laying uh, juice there to bet the money line at minus 104. I think part of the reason why we see the market where it's at is we're probably going to see a lot of Steelers fans at this game because Raiders are new to Las Vegas. Still the Steelers are one of the best traveling teams in the nation, as far as having a a nationwide fan base. So thinking about the crowd in this game, you're probably not going to see a lot of home field there, but to me, at least a lot of the value from home field stems from the fact that the Steelers are traveling across the country on a shorter week than usual because they played Monday night not to face the Las Vegas Raiders in this game. As far as injuries go here, I had concern entering this week about Jacoby Myers and Devontae Adams. Uh, Myers is in concussion protocol, and Adams got hit hard towards the end of Sunday's game. But Josh McDaniels on Monday was talking about those two guys, and he said Adams is good, which implies to me that he's not in concussion protocol, and Myers is progressing well enough where they think he'll be able to go this week. So... I thought there was a spot where they might have neither of those guys, but now there's a situation where they could have both those guys. And Jimmy Garoppolo played well when they were both healthy back in week number one and just funneled targets to those two guys. Minka Fitzpatrick left Monday's game due to an injury. That'd be a pretty big loss for this defense as well. The Raiders willing to pound the rock. So Cam Hayward out for this game for the Steelers. We saw how successful the Browns rushing offense was even after the Nick Chubb injury. Jerome Ford busting off big plays. I think we could see that once again here with Josh Jacobs. So I was on the Raiders last week and that obviously did not go very well. But my model makes them 1.95 point favorites in this game with this game being at home. So again, I think we're getting this as a a relative toss-up in large part because there won't be a lot of crowd favor uh, for the Raiders, despite this being a home game. But for me personally, I care more about the travel. I care more about the lack of rest. And I think those things do push us to favor the Raiders here. So I'll take the Raiders money line minus 104 against the Steelers for this week. Other two bets I like for this week are a couple of totals. First one is indoors and I actually get to bet some overs this week. I'm typically more of an unders kind of guy, just the way my model tends to uh, funnel me in general. And the first one is for the Falcons and the Lions. Over for this game is minus 115 over 45 and a half. And 
I'm going to take that. Neither of these defenses are very good. And now the Lions want to see Jay Gardner Johnson for this game. So a big loss to the secondary. So they're facing the Falcons and the Falcons are a very run heavy team and run heavy teams tend to be pretty slow, but relative to other like run heavy teams, I guess the Falcons aren't that like they're below average in pace so far this year. Uh, my colleague, Brandon Gadula runs some situation neutral pace numbers. And based on those, the Falcons a bit below average in terms of pace, but not like outliersly bad by any means. I think the lions specifically will be able to move the ball pretty well in this game. Uh, we've seen them play pretty well last week. They didn't have Taylor Decker at left tackle. They still put up 31 points against Seattle and forced that game to OT. This total was 47 and a half in the look ahead. It went down to 46 and a half on Monday, and it's now 45 and a half at this point. I'm, I mean, there's not really key numbers between, you know, 47 and 44 as much. So the movement doesn't matter a ton, but bit confused as to why this number has come down. My model puts this total at 49 and a half. So I'm going to take the over here. It is minus 115, which is worth keeping in mind, but I get to root for, for some offense for once. So uh, I will happily take that and take the over for the Lions and the Falcons. Second total for me is also an over, and that is for the Chiefs and the Bears. I know the Bears offense is going to have to score some points in this game, but honestly, the Chiefs could push for the overall by themselves. Total here is 47 and a half and the over is minus 110. It's just a situation where I've got the Chiefs pretty heavily favored in this game. A larger spread tends to imply a larger total. Uh, and it's just that the Bears have been truly, truly hideous so far. To put some numbers behind that, they have faced Baker Mayfield and Jordan Love. Now, again, Baker Mayfield is a guy I'm higher on the most and love has looked okay so far this year, but they've let up 0.5 EPA per drop back. Uh, according to number fires, EPA metric through two games while facing those two guys. Now number fires, EPA tends to be higher uh, than like other sources. So make sure you're, you're accounting for that for with the uh, accounting for that when hearing that number, but the league average is like 0.1 and they're at 0.5. So 0.4 expected points per drop back worse than league average. And now they're facing Patrick Mahomes when he's at home. So again, we do need some pushback here, but I feel like the bears sitting at 0 and 2 in a spot where, as Ryan mentioned, maybe Matt Eberflus is getting the seats getting a little bit hot there. Uh, Luke Getze seat, seat may be getting hot there as well. I feel like we'll see them start to lean into the, the Justin Fields rushing game a bit more once again. If they do that, that does help us get more offense in this game. So again, total is 47 and a half minus 110 on the over. The wind speeds currently are forecasted at nine miles per hour, which is a decent number. Uh, even with that being in there, though, my total or my model has this total at 50.1. So I am okay plugging in an over here on the Chiefs and the Bears. I feel like um, we're going to see the Chiefs offense kind of go nuts. And as long as the Bears can do anything, we should be able to get to 47 and a half. So uh, bets that I like so far this week, Chiefs, Bears over 47 and a half, Lions, Falcons over 45 and a half, the Raiders money line at minus 104, and the Buccaneers plus five and a half, which is currently minus 110 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's finish up the show for today by recapping recommendations from last week here on the show, the week-long recommendations. We had Dr. Ed Fang on to preview college football week three and NFL week number two. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. In college football, Ed had Houston plus seven and a half against TCU. That number did close at seven and a half as well. And this was a seven-point game at halftime, but Houston did nothing in the second half. TCU pretty dominant there. So uh no win for Ed on Houston plus seven and a half. But in the NFL, Ed had Buffalo minus eight and a half against the Raiders. They cruised and covered pretty easily for that one. So a one and one week for Ed. Again, check out his stuff at thepowerrank.com. Our props guest was JJ Zacharies and find JJ on Twitter at late round QB and find his work at late round.com and on the late round fantasy football podcast. And JJ had a stellar week. He went three and one and two of the hits in that three were plus money. Those were his two touchdown bets. He had Rashad White at plus 155 and Jake Ferguson at plus 360. Both those guys wound up scoring. So JJ now three and one on touchdown bets this year. Two of the hits were plus 310 and plus 360. So the fun touchdown bets also cashing for JJ thus far. 
Yardage bets for JJ were Baker Mayfield under 228 and a half passing yards and Brian Robinson over 17 and a half receiving yards. Baker played pretty well, so that one did not hit, but Robinson 42 receiving yards to hit easily there. So awesome week for JJ across the board. Good reads, good bets, and good recommendations by JJ. Again, find him on Twitter at late round QB. We had Ryan Williams on last night or yesterday to talk about Monday night football games. And as we discussed with Ryan, pretty good night for him. He had Rashid Shahid over 40 and a half receiving yards. Uh, and also an anytime touchdown of plus 310. No touchdown for Shahid, but 63 receiving yards for an over there. We talked about Chuba Hubbard over 44 and a half rushing plus receiving yards. He finished with 50. You know, a lot of it was some check downs, but those count too. That was part of the role with Hubbard. So uh, that one worked as well. He mentioned the Jonathan Mingo over, which hit. Uh, Ryan had the Steelers plus two and a half, and obviously they won that game outright. He had George Pickens over 42 and a half receiving yards. We talked about Pickens anytime touchdown markets. Pickens uh, to hit some alternate overs for yardage, and Pickens went nuts. Uh, so good call by Ryan on that one. Good read on the markets. Other one was Najee Harris for an anytime touchdown. Najee did not score. Didn't really lose a lot of extra work to Jalen Warren, um, despite the fact that Najee struggled once again. But no hit on the touchdown there. But overall, really good read from Ryan on his Monday Night Football recommendations. Again, find Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. I went two and two again on mine uh, for this week. Misses were not close. I had the Raiders plus eight and a half against the Bills. Did close at seven and a half, and they did start pretty well, but their defense was predictably pretty putrid. So uh, deserved a loss there for sure. Other one was the Texans money line, and this one also did move in my favor. It was plus 106 when we talked, and even though they lost Laramie Tunsil, they lost... Um, a couple players in their secondary before this game. It actually did close as with the Texans as being favored. I think it was minus 110 on Sunday morning. So good movement for me, but really bad result. Gardner Minshew shredded this defense. You could chalk it up to the secondary injuries. They lost another guy during the game as well. But, um, you know, they got torched by Gardner Minshew. Offense, I thought, played pretty well despite not having Laramie Tunsil. Uh, CJ Stroud is on the injury report with a shoulder injury. Thought they played pretty well, even though they had all those injuries, at least offensively. And I've got value on the the Texans once again this week. Uh, they're plus nine and a half against the Jaguars. Have not locked that one in yet, but I probably will. I know myself. I like CJ Stroud a lot, so I'll probably wind up getting there uh, despite the injuries. Hits were the Rams plus eight and the Patriots Dolphins under forty seven and a half. God bless Sean McVay, man. Um, I was reading uh, Michael Lombardi on Twitter last night. He said that McVay likely kicked the field goal because uh, point differential matters as far as uh, tiebreakers or point differential points scored. And kicking the field goal put them in a better position in that regard. So maybe that's why Sean McVay kicked the field goal. I personally don't care because I had plus eight and it covered as a result of that field goal. So Sean McVay, shout out to you. I appreciate that. I thought they played okay in that game, honestly. I know the defense wasn't great, but... Offense moved the football against a very tough team. So I think even though it was lucky to hit it based on the result, the Rams played well enough where I don't feel like I totally, totally uh, got lucky in hitting them at plus eight on that one. Other one was uh, Dolphins Patriots again, under 47 and a half finish at 41. So was a bit sweaty towards the end where the Patriots were driving with that Cole strange uh, lateral from Mike Gesicki, but Two and two, uh, both weeks so far. Feeling broadly good about my numbers. Uh, optimistic about heading into week three. Uh, I feel pretty good about things so far, based on what we've seen. Uh, if I look at my overall numbers this year, feeling pretty good. So we'll cruise into week number three and see if we can get above 500 for this year. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Want to give a big thank you once again to our guest, Ryan Williams. You can find him on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. We are back once again tomorrow. We're going to preview college football week number four. Better slate this week uh, for college football. We'll talk to Dr. Ed Fang about that. Ed is with us on Thursday as well. JJ Zacharyson and Rob Friedman coming up with you on Friday. Uh, if you got any questions from me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in. Good luck to you with your bets across the next couple of hours. We'll talk to you once again Wednesday. Talk some college football. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 